Okay. Welcome again. Uh, thank you very much. We have very few slides, I think 10 slides in all, um, to take you through how to achieve financial independence. So my name is William Mess. I'll start with you and then along the line, Nana Safo will join. Okay, so what will we be looking at today? Looking at what financial independence is. Why financial independence? Why is it an important topic? Enemies to financial independence. What are the things that will fight against you being financially independent? And then steps to achieving financial independence. And then we'll look at our conclusion and the things that you can take away. Okay. So, simply put, financial independence is the ability for you to sustain your desired lifestyle without a paycheck where the income that you are using to sustain that lifestyle is coming from your personal resources. Now, personal resources, these are investments that you have done that are generating the income that sustains your lifestyle. We'll go into more details about what kind of investments we are talking about, but as an introduction, that's what you have, want to bear in mind. So you can say you are financially independent if the in income that comes from your personal resources, your investments, is more than how much you need to sustain your life. Okay, why do we need to talk about financial independence? Why is financial independence possible? You know, when Phoebe was, was introducing the subject, she kept talking about um, so that you can stop working and all that. Believe you me, you would not want to stop working. You know, there is some kind of and work in itself is therapeutic. If you, if you are not able to work or if you are not in a position to work, you don't feel as fulfilled as if you are working. The problem people face with work is that they do jobs they hate. They are working with people they don't like. They, they hate everything about it, but they just have to get up and go to work because they really need that paycheck. Now, so financial independence is important, not because we want you to sit at home and put your hands in between your lap, but we want you to get to a place where you have the freedom to work and be productive without being enslaved by the paycheck. What it means is that you get up day to day and go to bed, go to bed with a spring in your step because you want to be where you are, not because you have to be where you are. It makes a huge difference if you are waking up to go to work because you want to be there not because you have to be there. And you become more productive and society as a whole benefits if you are financially independent. Financial independence is not to create a bunch of lazy guys who just sit at home doing nothing, but seriously motivated people whose motivation is not coming from the paycheck, but it is coming from something they want to achieve through it to make the society a much better place for all of us. Okay. So let's take an example. Financial independence, what is, it? what is it? Let's say today, your annual expenditure, I saw from the poll that the majority of the people here are less than, less than 40 years. Um, your annual expenditure is 52,000 Ghana cities. And your income for your investment is zero. Now, what this means is that the entire 52,000 cities gap needs to be funded from the paycheck. Your expenditure, 52,000. Income from assets, zero. Now, how are you going to finance the 52,000? You are going to finance it from blood, from sweat, and from tears because you hate what you're doing, but you have to get up and go and do it because without that, you're going to stop. You borrow money to buy your car. You borrow money to pay your rent. You borrow money, and then you are you are buried under a heap of debt. So even though you hate what you are doing, you have to get up and miss sweat, blood, and tears. Go and work because you need to pay the debt. So that is the picture that some of you will have today, and it's okay if that's your picture today. But three years from today, because you've been in this seminar, I expect to see a picture that looks like this. Your annual expenditure, of course, is going to go up, if not for anything, just because of inflation. But lifestyle changes also will cause your annual expenditure to eat. Your annual expenditure goes to 70000 But now, 
the income that is coming from your assets is 25,000 cities. So the gap that needs to be funded is 45,000 cities. So you would realize that now your income is more than the gap that you need to fund your excess expenditure, which means you can keep building on your assets to keep growing the income they are generating from your assets. So there's still a gap to be funded. How are you going to fund it? Still with blood, sweat, and tears. But now it is with a lot more joy because the plan is working. All of a sudden, you realize that your asset is generating a little percentage. I mean, 30% of your expenditure is not bad. You started from somewhere it's growing. So you are on your way to financial freedom. So there's a lot more joy and a lot more purpose that follows you when you wake up every day to go and generate. Seven years from today, don't worry about the number of years that I put, it's the concept that we're selling here, starting from today, some years down the line, and later on down the line. So I've used three years and seven years. Seven years down the line, your annual expenditure is 108,000 cities. But your income for your assets is 150,000 cities. What is the gap that you need to fund? Zero. Zero. So at this point, we say that you are financially independent because your assets are generating more income from your expenditure. Okay, let's look at enemies to financial independence. Now, the biggest hurdle most of you face is with the mindset. Guys, please give me a minute. Penny, I'm in a meeting, please go up. Sorry, I have a six-year-old who will not just listen to me. I am busy. Okay. Now, so the biggest hurdle that most of you will face is the mindset problem. Um, most of you are young people, and young people face this a lot. Now, if you're going to do well financially, you need a very strong mind to rise above these mindset hindrances. Number one is the consumption focus. Where all you think about is what car am I going to drive? What suit am I going to wear? What cologne am I going to use? What phone am I going to use? Everything that you think about to make you feel good about yourself has to do with expenditure. And it has absolutely nothing to do with how financially independent you are. Being financially independent is not a cool thing. What you find cool is what you wear, what you use, what you drive, and things about, and like that. In the short term, it is more appealing, and so most of you focus on that. Now, if you don't change your focus from consumption to chasing financial independence, it's going to be a very long journey for you. Number two, related to that, why do we consume a lot? Because we want to please others. We focus on our wants and not our needs. Financial independence is in the background. We ask someone puts it, you use money you don't have to buy things you don't need to please, to please people who don't care about you. I think it's a tragedy. Now, another thing that is going to be a hindrance to your financial independence is excessive borrowing. The, the, the bunch of people who are most repeated are the bank boys who did not get a renewed mindset before they started working in the bank. The, the bank, they need a bank to finance their cars, they need a bank to buy the rent, to pay the rent, they need a bank to get a house, they need a bank to everything they need the loan from the bank. And they end up in a heap of debt. You have to watch your borrowing, especially borrowing to consume. Borrowing money to put in a business or to invest is different from borrowing money to consume. The number one sin that you can commit if you're on this webinar is to borrow money to buy a toy. And you, the, the toy depends on whether you're a man or a woman. If you're a man, your toy is a car. <laughs> you're a woman, I don't know. I mean, you know, but that's one of the worst things you can. So beyond the mindset thing, the next thing that you need to deal with is procrastination. Some of you, you've been on too many webinars, but now you should have started something. 
but you still need someone to ginger you up. And each time you are gingered up, it only lasts three months, and then you slack back and you are waiting for the next webinar to come and ginger you. You have to get up and start doing something now. Number three is excuses. Number one excuse that I hear is I don't earn enough. You will never earn enough because as your income increases, so will your lifestyle adjust. So you will never have excess money. The, the trick is that you save first and you spend what is left after you've invested. Now, if you want to invest what is left after you've spent, there'll be nothing left for you to invest. So you put away some of the money first and let your lifestyle be determined by what is left. And number four is blame, failing to take responsibility. You blame the family in which you come from. If I were to be as fortunate as X, Y, Z, then I would have been able to do something about it. People have come from worse backgrounds than you have come from and have been able to do well financially. So you have to deal with these things. These are enemies to financial independence. You have to overcome them in order to be able to do well. Now, after you've overcome these hindrances, what are the steps that you have to take? The overriding principle is this. Do the simple, sensible thing consistently over a long period of time, and you will be fine. Now, the rest, we are going to talk about the details of the things that you want to do. Now, if you're only going to take two or three of these details and do it consistently over a long period of time, be much better off than one who tries to do everything and that's it for a short period and it's not consistent. So the overriding thing that you need to take away from this is that if you want to be financially independent, it is a journey, it is not a sprint. You have to do simple, sensible things consistently over a long period of time. Now, what are the sort of things that you have to learn to do? You have to learn to budget. Learn to budget. What are the most important things that you need to spend on? You don't just spend money and you start spending and, and let the future take, take care of itself. Learn to budget and live according to a budget. Set financial goals and plans. Some of you, if God were to come down physically in the physical form and ask you, what should I do for you financially? You, you don't even have a plan. Where do you want to get to three years from now? How do I help you then? You have no plan. Now, if you don't have a plan, and any journey will take you there. You don't know where you are going. Every journey looks like a good journey. So they come to you and they say, oh, this is what is happening now. You jump in and you follow. It's men's gold. Today, you jump in and follow men's gold. Tomorrow is this kind of uh, business. You, anything sounds good to you because you don't know where you are going. If you set your goals and you know where you are going, you are consistent and you follow the plan. Consistently live on less than you earn. This is a very, very, very important point. It doesn't look sexy, but if you don't learn to do this, you are going to have a hard time in your life. Consistently live on less than you can. If you want to live larger, increase your cash flow. But all the time, you have to ensure that your lifestyle is determined by a maximum, and I'm stating here, a maximum of 80% of your earnings. Maximum. Your lifestyle should be determined by a maximum of 80% of your earnings. For those of you here who are single, you should be talking about 60-50% of your earnings. Because believe you me, when you, when you have a family and the rest, if you, are, if you are struggling to let your cash flow, your income sustain your life now, then I don't know what you're going to do when you have a family. Okay, so minimum, you're putting aside 20% of your income in savings. If you are a tighter, then we, well, we are talking about 30% here, 10% goes to God, 20% goes into your savings account. You live on 70% of what is Invest all windfalls. Now, a windfall is money that you did not project to get. You did not, it's not part of your budget. You, it, just, it just happened. You just came into some kind. Now, most of us tend to waste this kind of money. Oh, I didn't expect this. So I just got some 5,000 free cash. Charlie, this is the time for me to buy all the shit I've been aiming to buy. Now, if you do not plan, you got the money. Then live your life as if the money did not come. Take the windfalls and put the windfalls away. I can tell you that personally, this is one of the things that changed my financial life significantly. When I was working in the bank, in Eco Bank, and everybody was living a lavish lifestyle, all the monies that came in excess of the regular 
to pay you 25% of your annual gross as rent supplement. When I take the money, I didn't look at his face to be tempted. Immediately, the money comes and goes straight into my investment account. I did all those things, the teaching I was doing on the side, all those actions, I, it all went in a separate account. If you're able to do that consistently, you will do well financially. Diversify your investments. Now, diversification does not mean close your eyes and just broadcast your seed, store it anywhere. It means that find good places to put your money, but don't put all your money in just one good place that you'll find. Find multiple investment vehicles and put your money in there. All of them, by your estimation, must be good, but don't limit yourself to one. Seek multiple streams of income. Don't limit yourself just to your, pay your paycheck. Seek to make multiple streams of income. If not anything at all, your extra income should be coming from your, your investment account. Okay. And do not take excessive risk. It's important. I can tell you young guys, I, I have been young before. I know that when you are young, you think you are invincible and you want to take so much risk and the rest. It is better to make reasonable returns consistently over a long period of time than to make 200% on a certain amount of money and then the next period, you go and lose that entire amount. It is better to make reasonable returns consistently and compound this over a long period of time. If you want to, if you are a natural uh, aggressive risk taker, limit that your excessive risk taking to maximum of 10% of your investment portfolio. I'm done and ask for say 2%. I'm generous. I say maximum of 10% of your investment portfolio. But if possible, just avoid excessive risk. Okay, good. I'll let Nana Safo take over from here. Thank you very much, William. Uh, I believe you've covered the topic. Uh, probably you should rather be letting people ask questions from here. You've done justice to the work, but um, I have to, I've been put on to say something. So let me take you through these few um, slides. One of the first things you need to establish is that today, know your net worth. The things that will give you income or your investment, write them down as part of action number one. And two, you should calculate, like the budget that he, William mentioned. William, can you continue for me so that I don't need to share my screen? William, okay, um, just go back one slide and I should be fine. So we're talking about being able to calculate your monthly spending. The idea of sitting down to calculate your monthly spending is that when you've seen over time how much you spend on maybe three months, you will see that, ah, this is a useless item. You know, I could have canceled it and live without it. So sometimes you don't know where you spend your money. But when you are able to put it, then you know how much of your expenses is coming, going to which sector. So bulk it, calculate your uh, monthly expense. Then know what you call your financial independence number. That is, if you go with a CB approach where after that you can retire, then it is simply finding your yearly spend and multiply by 25. If you multiply it in Ghana, you could even multiply it with 20 and be fine. In that case, your yearly spend now times that, that is your financial independence amount that you are working towards. Then you sit down and go to the next stage and say, how do I know or how do I get here? What is the savings rate that I need to make? Now, the rule of thumb is that, like William said, do 20%. You may start with, maybe your habit is so bad that you have to start from five. It is better than nothing. But calculate your savings rate that will get you there 
and knowing that will tell you exactly when, what date that you are going to be financially independent. It is workable. And let me emphasize this. The last point William made. When you get your promotion or somebody dash money to you, uh, when you were working in the bank, you used to call it moonlighting. Go and do a business plan for somebody, then a check. You didn't plan for it. Apart from maybe a good dinner that day, bank the rest, bank. What I used to do was that if I had a loan, another time when I started, I had a mortgage at HFC. The next morning, I am at HFC. I would do it. I would put it there. There was no point borrowing at 33. That time, interest rate was 33%. It didn't make sense. So I walked there, and, and lo and behold, within four years, the whole house has been paid. I was shocked. And it was because banks, they'll give you dressing allowance. They'll give you a rent allowance, all of it. Just go and dump it there and you'll be fine. Bank those ones, save them. And the one thing that if you don't get anything from this, saving from this does not mean leave your money in the bank account. Take it from me. Don't leave it there in a the bank account. Worst case, buy treasury bills. Worst case, better buy government of Ghana bonds and do it. But don't leave your money in bank account. They are you are just protect storing the value, maybe matching inflation at best. Next slide, please. Okay, so the group that on the call today, we have those under 30, and the majority from the poor were between 30 and 45. And then the over 45 to we have a considerable number. This is how we advise that you, you invest your money. This is the portfolio mix. It is driven by your age and the returns that we see. If you are under 30, you can do more chascale with your, or more risk, a little more risk. So under 30, you can do between 10 to 40% equities. Equities in Ghana, over the last five years are measurable, but overall they give good returns. So you can do that. But as you get to over 45, please limit your equities to under 20%. Maximum should be 20. Fixed income, government of Ghana, securities. Like William said, don't go and chase for the people who are promising high rates. Something decent around Ghana or govern, Ghana government bonds, which is around three, two to five year rate, is enough to give you. In fact, if the smartest people, hedge funds in America, who come to Ghana to buy our bonds, and they are making millions of monies out of this country, you have no business going to chase rates and having a miserable future. So after 30, make sure that 40 to 75% of, of your portfolio is between fixed income. If you are over 45, 50 to 85% should be there. A lot, the miserable thing that you tend to get is somebody who is close to pension, he's not building houses to rent. Please, if you are on this webinar, when you are over 45, stop this idea that I want to build houses and rent them. The entire portfolio should not exceed 15% of your total wealth of investment. Businesses, you can start businesses and other. When you are over 45 and you want to start business, please seek financial advice. You can put 10% of your money into a new business, fine, but don't put more than that, if you are over 45, it is risky for you. Let me try to, and I, I think we've spent about 30 minutes, so let me summarize and then we will ask you guys to ask us all the questions. In summary, what, as William has explained, financial independence is attainable. I come from a, a village, um, I don't want to go there, 
but today I can say that I've achieved financial independence. I've worked with William for since what, 2009. I think we, we can both say that we are financially independent. So it's doable. But the first step to become financial independence is learn to invest. If you don't invest, you will never be financially independent. And the time to start is now, it's not tomorrow. If you don't have time, I think they will give us details. We are happy to talk to any of you, direct you free of charge, it's fine. And then today, try and swap one bad habit with a good financial habit. One bad habit, try and do it. And then track your progress. It is okay to talk to um, three investment advisors. It is okay to go to data bank and say that, look, for instance, go to data bank and ask them, my mom says I should not bank here. So give me five names where I can, I can go, five good places that I can go. When you leave that place, you have a list of five. Go to uh, Fidelity or Stanley and ask them. By the time you are done, one or two good places where you can invest your money will run through that list. And then you take your decision going there and track your progress, you sit down, and then you can get free consultation just by going to these finance houses. It is important that you take it serious. And worst case, um, the best you can do is I always take a, a mentor. A mentor does not necessarily have to be somebody in Ghana you go to see. Read about somebody who posts things on uh, social media, Facebook, or YouTube. Try and read about him. If it's Warren Buffett, fine. I went to see him. He gave me fantastic ideas. So on that note, I think we will hold it here and then take questions from you. Thank you very much. OK, um, thank you very much, Nana. Um, unfortunately, Phoebe is having a bit of network issues, so I'll take over from here and then Hopefully we'll have a successful one. Okay. Um, thank you once again for the presentation. I think we've learned a few things. I have learned a few. I'm sure mo most people have learned a, a lot from your presentation. Um, we just have a few questions to ask. So um, in your presentation, you were telling us how you think you know financial independence is attainable and all that and certain things we should do and not do at certain times but you know we live in an environment where so this is the first um question from the audience okay so someone is asking that in an environment where you know food prices keep increasing on a daily basis or weekly basis yet we, we, we get stuck with the same income every now and then. How then do we budget and you know, invest the little monies that we have in our bid to attain financial independence? Did he say food prices? Yes, so the prices of food and you know, services keep increasing. Okay, yes, I, I, would have wish, I would have wished that he didn't use the food example because as for food, uh, there's a budget for food for everyone. Have you not gone taking your car to mechanic before and watch the mechanics buy Gary and Beans? They take coins <laughs> from their pocket, they buy Gary and Beans, and that's enough lunch for them. So I don't think I don't think food is a is a good example because there's a, there's there's food for every budget. Uh, I think that you can you can go out there with five CDs and have a fantastic meal if. <laughs> If you want, so food is not a very good example. Anyway, I think but William, I get it. Yes, I, I, I'll say that one of the, I from experience, one of the things that you find is that, for instance, you go to a, a place where you join a place and you see that everybody is paid, and you know, you can easily 
have Kofi Brookman, Fantastic, or Friday, and be fine. But because everybody is buying packed food around lunchtime, everybody is going to this restaurant and buying food, then you, you get sucked. That's when you are looking at other people. But somebody who ha- can spend 1000 a month, the same person can make adjustment and save 50 and work with 950 Ghana, and he'll be fine. Yeah. Eat twice a day instead of three. If you want to eat good, I mean so one of the one of, <laughs> one of the things that pains me is the person who hasn't got ten mil, ten thousand in his bank account, but he's he's replacing a crack phone at thousand seven hundred cities, and you live in Africa, you don't <laughs> have it. So th- these are the things. It's not only food. You can find maybe, but, but some of the adjustment you need to make is things like phone, 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 phone. Don't look at other people when they are changing phones every year. Put in a bank account. You know what will happen? Three years afterwards, when you show them your investment statement, they will know that you are the smartest among it, all of them. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I think it, it, it boils down to living within your means rather than... Um, it's, a, it's, a that, mind, uh, it's a mindset change. If you yeah. change the mindset, you'll be fine. Okay. Um, we have a question from Beatrice. Beatrice is asking, have, are bonds fixed deposit investments and is it advisable to own foreign fixed deposit investments? And also, is it also advisable to invest in foreign mutual funds or ETFs? Okay. So bonds, bonds are fixed income instruments, not fixed deposits investments. Fixed deposits, uh, well, they are all debt, they are all um, instruments through which institutions borrow money, but, but they are subtle differences. So they are both fixed income instruments. Is it okay to buy foreign denominated ones? As long as you know what you are doing. The, the, the thing is that where you are, the jurisdiction in which you are, you understand what is happening here enough for you to take advantage of the instruments here to make money. Have you finished mastering that for you to now go and seek opportunities outside? So I don't think there's a yes or no answer to this. It might be a yes to someone, it might be a no to someone. How, how knowledgeable that, that, that what you have to bear in mind is that you cannot consistently make money outside of your circle of competence. You must be competent at something to be able to make money in it. Okay, so the fact that I make money doing X, Y, Z, that does not necessarily mean that you can come and follow me, do the same X, Y, Z and make money if you are not competent at it. So if you are competent at it and you want to buy foreign denominated bonds or ETFs and things like that, there's nothing wrong with it, but where you are, have you finished with the opportunities? That's what I would say. I I, I think uh, if you you are doing foreign investment and it's more than five percent of your portfolio, um, maybe you need to revise it. I'm I'm not against it, but I don't see if hedge funds are coming to Ghana and buy bonds. And over the, William, I think when we did it last year was what, between five to 7% returns on the dollar, right? Just yeah. buying government of Ghana bonds, one eighty day bonds was about seven, well, 7% on the dollar compounding. I don't see why you should waste too much time trying to understand an ETF. Unless you are sophisticated, fine, go. If not, you are better off here. So I, 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 have, I have been in this industry for a long time. I don't have any portfolio in the US. So this year, I have started looking at some ETFs. They look interesting. But even if I go into them, believe you me, there will be a maximum of 10% of my portfolio. And I think I'm a, I'm a quite sophisticated investor. But you have to be where you are comfortable. Okay. Um, thank you. We, we have um, 
a lot of questions today, so we would have to um, be quick. Um, how do you identify a good place to invest your money? I think Nana Safura answered that question towards the end of this presentation, but you have to shop around and ask questions. Okay. Um, there is a personal question for Nana Safo. Um, can you tell us more about how you set up Bora briefly? The inspiration and something brief about how you set up Bora Capital. All right, that's uh, different. Um, I think after um, my essay for my MBA was we will set up, I will, I will run one of these investment boutique myself. So it was something that was there. And then um, what happened? Uh, the, the price. We, we came up with this idea of when we were investing, uh, how to crack the informal sector pension in Ghana. And we did the analysis and everything was that, okay, it's a big business. Then it was like, okay, I think I need to go and do this. But since the time I was going to do my MBA and all that, we had more or less packed enough investment that even if we don't get our paycheck, we can um, support the children. We had enough investment to do it. So that was it. I think the money to do it, I needed to sell my part of my shares in Fidelity Bank then as the seed capital the rest is history but um I, I think yes it involved a lot of sacrifice but um that's how it started it was more to go and push for my own pension as a deal the rest is actually um blessing from the lord but uh the main thing was go and do my own pension all right um william this yes. one is for you um, now Adole is asking, as a young person who knows rent takes a huge toll on our financial freedom, would you advise that um, the audience okay, take a mortgage or you would still want them to rent? Okay, rent, rent is a killer. I mean, the, the earlier you start avoiding paying rent, especially because of the way rents are paid in Ghana, where you have to pay two, three years in advance. The earlier you can avoid it, the better. What it will mean is that you have to start something small, if it means taking a mortgage on a small house, so that the difference between your mortgage payment, remember that your mortgage payment, you are paying monthly, you are not accumulating two years more and pay to the financialist. So the burden on you as a young person is not as much as your rent payment where you have to accumulate and pay. If you're going to start off with a small place where your mortgage payment is not so much more than the rent you're going to pay, maybe 20, 30% more than the rent, but you are not paying it in bulk, it's a good place to start. But immediately you do that because interest rates are high, you have to start killing it as, hard, as quickly as possible. You have to start killing it. If you have a place where you can start your life off and free, even if it's not the ideal place for you, but it's a place for you to start, it will not be a bad idea to start at that place rent free for the first three to five years of your life. Save like crazy. If you have your own plot of land, build the outhouse, complete one room and move in there and start your life. The, 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 the more you can avoid paying rent, Sometimes it is not avoidable. You start off paying rent, but as much as possible, make sure that you are good. You are not paying for fanciful things. You are, you are paying rent to somewhere you want a fanciful place. You know, basic stuff. Save as much as possible to get rid of that. Bed. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important thing that you have to get rid of. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, another one. This one is for Nana Safo. <laughs> Okay, um, so someone is asking, okay, um, Prince wants to know, not me, but there is another Prince here. <laughs> he said, apart from the treasury bills and government bonds, what other investment securities would you advise that um, 
individuals invest in, especially in a time like this where there are lots of uncertainty? Hmm. Okay. Um, I think at the moment, a large percentage of uh, monies are going to um, government of Ghana bonds uh, or quasar government bonds like Tesla and Cocoa Bills. And then um, we have about four banks that we give money to and then we also give money to three of the top salary back loan, uh, salary back savings and loan. Those that focus on salary back loans, those are the three that I, we've selected and we give money to. The rest at the moment, the market is a bit uh, not challenging, let me put it that way. So those are the, the place that we give our money. Um, equities are cheap, but don't go into equities if you don't have stomach for it. Um, equities are cheap well, on the market, equities are cheap. But like I said, looking at your age and then the group that you belong to, pick your stock very well. If you don't understand how that company makes money, don't give them your money. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a hand raised. Um, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, um, I'm trying to unmute you so that you ask your question. So if you can hear me, Emmanuel Mabo, you can unmute yourself and... Okay, he's not ready yet. Um, Okay, so there is another one, and William, I think you should take this one. So, what is the ideal in interest rate that we can look out for whilst you know committing ourselves to these um, investment packages that you are mentioning? Okay, so let me start off by saying that you see, um, we are not out of. The woods yet as a country and um, the turbulence that we went through in the financial industry we are not out of it yet so now we st we still will pitch caution over chasing returns okay so when when you are looking for returns now you're looking at something around what you can get in the very safe instrument, government of Ghana instrument, which um, the returns of maximum 2021 there are out. It's the tops of what you, you should be looking at now. Um, until things, until the economy itself picks up, business confidence comes up, financial institutions become strong. So remain cautious. Buy safe government instruments or your worst case, these payroll lenders. So until things smoothing out before you start facing any interesting news. That's what I would say. Okay. Thank you. And um, please keep the questions coming in. Um, if you want, okay. So we have a hand raised, George. George Quest, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. My question is, um, with, I know our stock exchange has not been performing well for the past, for the last five years or so. And I think it's the fifth worst performing stock exchange in Africa now. So, um, will you advise we invest in stock exchange, in the stock exchange as a, let's say, um, for a retirement fund, um, taking into consideration one's risk appetite and all that. Is it still advisable for one to invest in the, in the Ghana Stock Exchange? Okay. Now. Okay. So as Nana said, equities are cheap now. However, equities is not for everyone. Um, I am buying equities. I have started adding equities, more equities to my 
However, it doesn't mean everybody should go ahead and do the same. Remember that I have been in equity since 2003 or some 2003. Okay. So, uh, as I said, you cannot make money sustainably outside your circle of competence. So, I probably will be able to choose equities better than most people on this webinar. But even that, I'm cautious about how much of my portfolio I put in equities, also because now I'm no longer a young man. Again, please. Um, I want to ask. Um, um, what should what should be the benchmarks for um one's investment um for the investment vehicle one should back? Let's say um, should we always benchmark it against inflation rates? Or because now I see the T bill is not it's not that attractive considering um, if you consider inflation rates now so should we be going more into the mutual funds for i invest with, with data bank and, and i i have observed that the m, the m fund is doing well so i was thinking no oh, why don't i push more of my funds to the m fund and and and, and, and have you have you bothered to ask yourself what is m fund investing in yes so i know they invest in, is in bonds in commercial purpose and all that. Yes, I know, I, I know, yeah, I, I, found, I found out what they are investing in. Okay. okay. Can I buy it in here? Yes. Um, all right. Okay. You see, no. I, I, after today's webinar, right, next time you go to the bank, tell them not to buy treasury bills for them. Tell them to buy you bonds. We, when we were, you didn't know anything. You tell them to buy bonds. The bonds, the last government of Ghana bond was 18.25. It closed only this. So why should the bank be buying treasury bills for you at 14% when you could actually buy it for 18.25 and invest for two years? So it's not just that, like William asked, M fund is buying bonds and other fixed income because all the individuals going to the bank to buy it ask for treasury bills instead of bonds. And the best person to protect your money is for you to learn the difference. Take a, a day, do on the net the difference between notes and bonds and track it. You go to Bank of Ghana's website, the rates are there, the two year bond, one year bond. And just tell the bank that I want one year or two year bonds. I don't want treasury bills. That alone will save you about two, three percent in returns. Over okay. year, over the years, it will be good for you. All right. Thank you very much, Nana. Um there is a question from Jazz. I think Jasmine. Okay, no, let me take this one first. Um Naomi wants okay, Naomi said. I noticed that you use 25 times annual expenditure. Mm -hmm. Does that mean we should be looking to spend only 4% of our portfolio yearly? William, I, I think you should take this one. I don't, I don't even understand the question. Yeah. Okay. So the person the wants to know what, what, what percentage of your of your income should you spend right and what oh, so that 25 percent is your long term uh, not 25 times it's your long term target mm -hmm. so that the amount of money you have the assets that you have okay. what multiple of your income or your expenditure is it so if in a year you spend hundred thousand we are saying you must have two uh, you must have 2.5 million CDs in investment to ensure that you are financially independent. So that's a just to help you set a certain target to work towards. It's not okay. about the savings rate. It's that long-term target. Okay. Thank you. Um, Na Adole, okay, no. Um, this one is from Richmond. Richmond wants to know how much do you need before you can invest in bonds? Government bonds.
No, I, I, I don't think bonds are expensive. I, I think what the banks have made people to understand is that you need a minimum amount to be able to buy it. Um, almost every last year, uh, sorry, last year during the financial crisis, we said that every client of ours, if you have, um, I think if you have more than 10,000, 20% of your portfolio, we will buy, you will take it and buy government of Ghana bonds for you and we buy them. You have to find um, a good institution that can run it for you nicely. Um, I, I, I don't see it as a, there's, there are ways to go around it. I think using a minimum amount is a, is a way of the banks trying to make it difficult for you to buy. They say that the minimum, I think the last one that was that was the minimum, they said 50,000 per lot. But then if every fund manager who is buying bonds or bank that is buying, they buy it in bulk and they allot. They don't put your individual, in it. they buy it in bulk and allot. So you can buy the bond. With hundred cities. With hundred cities. If, if you go to your if you go to your investment manager. Yeah. So can can people come to Bora and buy bond for hundred cities? I mean by um, my gardener, my gardener, when I pay him, I take fifty cities every month and then go in and give it to them to invest for him. It's whether they we buy fixed deposit or buy a government bond, that's his investment for the month. And it gets invested every every two days, so it's it's doable. All right, thank you. Um, there is this one too. The CD has been depreciating continuously for some years now. Um, how do we overcome this problem with uh, assets depreciating amidst increasing inflation? You are, mixing, you are mixing two things. You are talking about depreciation and you are talking about inflation. So the inflation okay, so the is wants to know, okay. The inflation is, is is what hits us directly here because you earn CDs, you you spend CDs. Okay, so your true enemy is is inflation. inflation. There's an element of inflation that is influenced by the exchange rates because we import a lot of things. But your true enemy here is inflation. Now, as long as your return is giving you something in excess of inflation, we talked about government securities giving about eighteen point five percent. What is current inflation? Um, Prince, you know inflation better than anybody. I think it dropped to nine point six this month. Last month, so roughly ten percent. Yeah. Okay, so, so we are getting a real return of eight point five percent, even on government on government securities. Exchange rate, exchange rate is a problem only if you are investing in CDs to now go and spend the money in dollars. Besides that, it is the effect that exchange rate has on inflation, but that's already already captured in the inflation, if you are beating inflation. So exchange rate for someone who earns CDs and spends in CDs is not the biggest problem that you have. Okay. Thank you. Um, someone wants to know with regards to treasury bills, which, which one would you advise that we invest more in? Is it the 91 day bill or the 182 or the 364 day bill? If, if you look at the differences in rates, it's better to buy two years, three years now. It's just that there are three years and above, they, they don't go for auction often, so it's not as available. But the longer the tenor, the better it is. So minimum you're doing one year. I did it do two years, if you can find three years too. Okay, thank you. Um, Nana, please answer this one for me. Um, will you say someone is financially independent if the person has 85% of their income invested, and then the person lives on only 15%. Or what, what is the ideal percentage of 
income that you would want to be invested. Uh, which of the income? His salary? Are you talking yes, about salary. That? And then he's investing 85%. Yes. <laughs> okay. It, that will, that's the savings rate is 85%. That's what you mean. It means that the person can achieve the financial independent target earlier than somebody who is doing maybe 10%, 20%. But it does not mean because when we say that um, you need to know your budget, if, if you are living with your parents, you can save 85%. If you are living alone, definitely the expense will go up. The thing is, the ideal situation is that try and save 20% or more, but 85% only brings the number of years that you have to wait till you become financially independent. But if you are very good and you can starve yourself that much, then welcome to the, you get there early. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, we have another one. It's a lengthy one, so I'll read it out. Um, the person, can you further explain the investment allocation given to rent? The real estate sector in Ghana seems very lucrative, especially when considering the retail values, that is buying and selling. And most people above age 30 seem to be focused on building for commercial purposes. So what percentage allocation do you think people should give to their real estate investments? And do you also think it's advisable for people to be engaged in real estate um, development? Let me start and then I will come, uh, come here at the end. You know, the uh -huh. asset allocation that we give are just guidelines. Okay. Yeah. Now, real estate, it is not all real estate transactions that make sense. You have to be careful. You know, in Ghana, people see all sorts of things. You can't go wrong with real estate and all sorts of mantras that people throw around. Some real estate transactions are good. Others are not good. Remember that we are talking here about financial independence. So the focus of the asset allocation was on the income from the, from the real estate and not buying and selling to build capital. So those are two different things. If you're buying and selling, then that, that forms part of your business portfolio. It doesn't form part of your real estate portfolio. You are buying something to sell. It can be in chips or whatever. Real estate just becomes the asset that you, the thing that you are buying to sell. So you are not in real estate. You are, you are buying and selling something. Okay. Now, so if you have a market for it, or you are buying and selling, or you are building and selling, again, you have to be very careful. I have a friend who's put all his money in three properties, and he's not able to sell one of them, and he's really hard up. Because the property is in the wrong location and he's targeting the wrong people. You know exactly what you're Okay. Now, those are the asset allocations we give are just guidelines. It doesn't mean that it is cast in stone. If you understand real estate, real estate is something that you do very well. Then you can vary it and have a little more in than the average person. But remember, we are talking to a large group of people, mainly people who are in employment. So the advice is targeted as those people and not someone who understand the real estate business as. Okay. Um, I have a follow-up question from Benjamin. Benjamin, if you can unmute yourself so that you ask your question. Benjamin Arthur. Okay. Emmanuel also wants to ask a question. Emmanuel, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, Emmanuel. Okay, Emmanuel is unavailable. Edmund Jane Fee. Edmund. Okay. Um, Edmund is also unavailable. All right. Hello. Okay, Edmund is here. Hi, Edmund. You can ask your question. Yes. Okay, thank you, Prince. Uh, find out, you know, with the current trend with MTN shares, I want to find a good start for our beginners. Uh, or the way they are performing on the stock market. Is it good to go in now or we should wait a bit? 
Okay. So you are beginning. I have not much shares before at all. Yes, I've not bought shares before at all. Okay, so the first thing I would say is that this first approach of asking is MTM good, is this one good, is this one good, is the beginning of your troubles. What does it mean by a stock being good? Okay, what makes one stock good or what makes one bad? You need to start, you need to learn that. Okay, I can I can sit here and throw out uh, see this one is good, this one is good, blah blah blah. That is not going to help you. What what do we mean by a stock being good? good for who? Because depending on your investment objective, what is good for you might be very bad for my father because my father is 80, 83 years old. If he is buying any investment, he's looking at income. You are looking at capital exchange. You are looking to invest for one year. You are looking to invest for ten years. All that is going to decide whether this particular investment is good for you or not. Okay, so. Be, be, be careful. That's that's the problem that we have in this country, not just in the stock market, in everything. Um, things are thrown around. Oh, this is very good, and then everybody goes to do it. This is very good, and then everybody goes to do it. The fact that someone is doing something and making money does not mean that it is good for you. Okay, so if you want to go into equities, first of all, try and understand uh, what what makes what are you looking out for in the first place if you are choosing a company to invest in what are you looking out for i would suggest that keep keep doing the same things that you are doing now and increase your knowledge base before you start investing in equity don't start by asking people but this is because i can tell you that if you ask five people what to invest in uh, which company to use you might get five different answers and most of the out of this five only one person might even know what he's talking so that is not a good place to start. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one thing that this is a, a request for me. The the last time I listened to William talk about real estate investments and the difference between calling real estate and investments and then being involved in real estate investments. So. I don't know if you remember, but if you can yeah. tell people um, what you said about building a house and staying in it, or building a house and renting it out. Yeah. Just to educate. Yeah. So, yes. We, we hear all sorts of things. Like um, if you're listening to an advert, um, there's one ad um, real estate company that does an advert and they say, your house is your biggest investment. One of the biggest lies that you can be sold, the house in which you live, is what is most of the time the, sing, the single biggest expenditure item that you would have. It's not the single biggest asset that you have. That house in which you live is, is money that you have put in one, in one property that you are living in, and that money is not available for you to do anything else out. Okay. Now, remember that we said that try and avoid rent when you can. Now, when we talk about trying to avoid rent when you can, we are talking about ensuring that you don't use too much of your money to even pay some landlord to own the house. In the same way, if you put too much of your money in the house in which you live, you, know, you, you cause the same problem you are trying to avoid. Okay, so when, you, when you're thinking about real estate, you have to know whether you are using that piece of real estate as a consumption or you are using it as an investment. And to make it clear, I like to use my own example, my own situation as an example. So I live in a small community, a small gated community. My neighbor who lives just across opposite my house works at the African Development Bank, so he's not in Ghana, so rents the house out. Four years back, I knew how much he was charging as rent, and it was $1,500 a month as rent. Now, it means that if I don't live in my house, I can rent my house out and charge $1,500 minimum, because that's what you're charging for. Now, if I take this $1,500, I can go and rent a place for $500, and then put the $1,000 in my pocket. So every month, I am receiving an income of $1,000 from the house in which I'm living today. At that point, that house is an asset. As I live in now, it is not an asset, because 
But the only thing I'm avoiding is rent that I am not paying. And if I were to be paying rent to someone, I would not be paying 1,500 rent. The maximum I would pay would be $700 or something. Right? Okay. So it's a consumption item for me. Now, once you understand that, you see, so there's nothing wrong with it. It's whether you understand what you are doing or not. Once you understand that and you are taking the decision from the right perspective, I want my children to grow up in a nice place. Blah, blah, blah. You know that it's a consumption item and you are doing it. You do it only when you have the resources to do it. You are not going to sweep everything you have and go and borrow in addition and all those things and add it. You do it when you can afford to do it and still continue to do other things. You have to bear that distinction uh, in mind. Okay. Thank you very much. Nana, do you have um, something to add? No, I think he's done well to the subject. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Basel, Basel, um, Basel wants to ask a question. Basel, can you unmute yourself and then join us? Basel, okay, Basel is unavailable. Um, Nana, one, this one is for you. Can I instruct my my investment firm to invest in offshore exchanges for me, like um, New York Stock Exchange and then the London Stock Exchange. <laughs> Is this something Bora can do? Yeah, good evening. I wanted to find out about the government of Ghana. Oh, okay. Basel. Is it Basel? No, someone else. Is. Yeah, Basel is on. Basel on. Oh, okay. Yeah, but he's still muted. Okay. But Nana, kindly um, respond to this one. You said, can you can we do invest in offshore exchanges, foreign exchanges, stock exchanges? To do it and do it very well, you need a minimum amount to have a good custody account. Okay? To okay. be able to do it and do it well and monetize. So we, we don't focus on the very rich who can afford that international custody rate. But it's doable. We are smart enough to know how to do it. It's just that we don't do it for all of our clients um, because it's just sometimes it's not too beneficial. But we will, sit, we will be happy to sit down with the client and say, okay, if that's what you want, we will just do it. We can create a brokerage account online and just do it for you. But sometimes it's not the most beneficial. I mean, yeah, we can have a conversation around it. Okay. Um, William. Yes. <laughs> is there something you want to say about that? Investing um, in foreign exchanges. Uh, well, so what I can add is that if you, if you know what you are doing, if, if you know what you are doing, um, if there are some... Houses. I know that um, Fidelity Bank, for instance, have this, um, I forgot what they call it. They have a certain unit that gives you access to invest in some foreign exchanges mm -hmm. right from here. You can buy Apple shares or something. Be sure what you are doing because they have two things. They have one that is not the real deal where you are buying um, some derivatives, but they have a platform that allows you to buy instruments on, you know, but that's only if you know what you are doing. I, I, I don't know. If you have not explored the opportunities available here, I don't think those are the things that you should be excited about. If as a beginner, that's not where really you're focused. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So this question keeps coming in over and over again. Okay. Is, is EDC a safe haven? <laughs> okay, so the person that's, what someone, that's what someone is asking. If EDC, the person sent it to me on the on the side, and I answered it. I said there's there are no safe havens. There's nothing that you you can call a safe haven and say, as for this place, if you take your money there, it's your bank. What you can say about EDC is that they've been around for a long time. They have systems in place, so. I mean, they are, they are relatively safe. But there is no, the only thing that we call safe even in investment is lending your money to government. Even that, 
we've had situations in some places where they have been they have been uh, defaults. Russia has defaulted before, Argentina has defaulted a number of times, and things like that. So there is no safe haven anywhere. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me see if I missed any of the questions that came in. Okay. Um, this one wants to know which banks can I invest with? Which banks in Ghana can I invest with? No, um, okay, so there are banks that there are banks I'm, I'm trying to answer in this way there are banks that you can do fixed deposit with okay and usually you are safe i think at the moment after the cleanup almost all the banks i'll say almost all the banks are safe um there are maybe two three of private yeah that are still not up of the woods yet but almost the rest are all safe. I think the difficulty you will have is that if you can buy a government bond or even treasury bill at 14, 182 day at 14%, and then you go and give your money to a bank and then they look at you and give you 8%. 8%. I mean, at the last investment committee meeting, a bank quoted 9%. And I was like, why are they trying to insult? So I asked the person, are you sure the person know the company is Bora? <laughs> <laughs> they said, yeah, yeah, they are aware. And it's okay. So I, I don't understand. At worst case, Ghana government can print my money for me. They can print it and damn the consequence. Addison came in and we saw banks collapsing. And so why should you give your money to a bank? that is going to give you a lower rate than you can get from Ghana government. That is the first question you need to answer before you choose, okay, you've cleared it. The banks that have, are going to give you higher than that are this and that. Then you choose one of them. I think a bank, yeah, a bank that has got, almost usually a bank that has been around long enough it's safe. Some were here before colonial times, they are here. Some have got parents, they are, they are fine. Eh? They are fine. And okay. then... <laughs> the most those... important thing is that don't give your money to a bank and accept a rate lower than the government will give you. Because that's the yeah, lowest, that's the the lowest risk you can take is give your money to government. If you are giving your money to a bank, you are taking high risk. Don't accept a lower rate. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have George, George here to ask a question. George. Okay. And this question goes to Nana. Um, um, I want Nana to elaborate more on the bonds, bonds issue for me, because I know when you have a mutual fund, mutual funds ordinarily invest in bonds for you. So mm -hmm. how do you then go and say, no, I want you to buy bonds for me, spend bonds. How, how different is that? Because mutual funds already invest in bonds. So, how no, 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 no. Okay. I, I think, um, so you are talking about mutual funds, right? Yes. So if you go to a mutual fund, then I think the most important thing is look through their, um, what this is, what they call the fact sheet and see where they are investing the money. There will be a percentage that says that a bond here and that, and that should be what you should do or look at for it. And then you should see whether that mutual fund, the last three years, what is their average return? Look at their last five years and their current rate. If over the last three years, they are not beating government of Ghana bonds, for instance, they are not at performing it. Then the question you should ask yourself, why don't you just ask the same company, instead of buying bonds, uh, buying their mutual fund, because of their, their client, ask them to buy you a bond as a separate account. Different and not necessarily buy the mutual fund. 
that is what I was trying to explain. I think what he, what he needs to understand is that the mutual fund is a product that is being sold by investment house. Yes. Okay. That investment house can buy bonds for you separately. You don't need to be part of the mutual fund. Oh, okay. Mutual fund is a product they are selling. All right. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so for those of you who have been asking whether this video will be available, yes. The video will be available for all those who missed the webinar. And those of you who joined and maybe due to poor internet connection, you couldn't hear some of the things that were said. It will be available on YouTube and also on Facebook for you to stream. If you registered um, for the webinar, kindly check your mails. If you can't find Invest in GH in your mail, kindly check the promotions tab. If you use Gmail, check the promotions tab for investing DH mails. I think that is it for the announcements. Okay, so final question from Emmanuel. I hope this time around he'll be able to ask his question. Emmanuel Jamna, can you unmute yes. yourself? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, please, the last question I would like to pose is that uh, I'd like to ask uh, our co-host, what financial books did they read which limited them in mindset? And in lifestyle, in habits, which brought them to where they are. Okay, I I, I read a lot. Um, I, I read a lot. Um, there are some simple books. Um, there are some all time ones that never fade away. Uh, the richest man in Babylon. Okay. Um, think can grow rich. Um, rich that poor dad. Um, but basically, I was like a sponge. Anything that I find that is talking about either business or investment, I wanted to lay my hand on. So read as much as you can, as much as you can find. That's what I want. Okay. Um, and, 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 and for a young person, target, target to read something every day. Make it a point. Whether it's some some article you are reading on the internet or some book you are reading, add add knowledge to yourself every day. That is also going to that's also a useful habit to take on. Okay, um, we are taking the last question from Beatrice. Okay. Um, hi, please can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, I I would like to say a very big thank you first of all, and um, the information has been very valuable. But one last question. Um, when Dana and William were talking, they kept mentioning something about. Oh, um, okay. Beatrice, can you hear? Yeah. yeah, I can hear you. All right. Um, Beatrice, we can't hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can yes. hear you now. Okay, I just wanted a little, little clarification on the payroll and the, they said something about it, um, apart from the bonds, but I didn't get that part very well. Will you want to take it? Okay, so these are businesses whose, whose line of business is to give loans to people who are paid through the controller and accountant general. So basically, have people on government payroll. So their whole business model is to give loans to these guys. Now, from source every month, whatever interest that has been charged on the loans that they have taken through these institutions, taken at source from controller and paid into the institution's account, guaranteeing that the, the risk of default is very, very small. You still have a few issues where someone quits the job or there's some technical problem at registrar general, at controller general. But most of these guys, if you look at their portfolio at risk, it's somewhere around 5%. So they are, they are like safe businesses. Um, they are in the business of lending, but they are not lending to businesses. They are not lending to Makola women and the rest. Most of the people lending to businesses have had serious issues since the business environment itself is having problems. But the guys who are lending to people on government payroll, they have survived and they don't have much of a problem. So if you 
if you give your money to these guys to do business with them, because you do business with because their business itself is safe, your money tends to be safe. So that's what we're talking about. Okay, thank you very much. And last okay. final question. Um, so how do we invest in them? I mean, for the payroll lenders, do we have to go to the, um, to the investment banks as well? You can do that, but you can also buy instruments from them directly. But you can, um, the advantage of doing that through your investment advisor is that your investment advisor is constantly monitoring them. If you can buy directly from them, you buy from them and you say everything is fine. But the investment advisors, because they are aggregators, they take money in bulk and they invest with them. Every, every time their financials are released, they are analyzing their financials, they are calling them up, asking them questions. They are deviating from their core business by deviating. So they tend to see where problems are coming ahead of time and they can advise you better. But you can, you, so you can either do it through your asset management company, your investment advisor, or you can do it directly. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, one more announcement. We have Invest in GH has WhatsApp groups that you can join in and then um, send your questions, feedback, and everything to us. We communicate with our audience and members on a daily basis. So the link is available in the chat session here for everyone to click and then join. Um, when it gets full, we'll create another one and then we'll send it to your mails. So if you haven't registered, once again, register on our website. If you also want to buy bonds or fixed deposits, um, Eli, one of the partners of Investing GH works with SIC Brokerage. So you can contact Eli. His number is available on the website so that he will sort it out for you. If you want contact details of our speakers for today, you can also get it. We'll provide them in the chat section very soon. We'll also send you a mail after this. For those who have registered um, on the website, we'll send you a mail with everything that went on here, links to the YouTube videos, and then any other materials to support you. Um, if you have any feedback or any question, kindly send us a mail or a WhatsApp message. You can also give us a call. Um, our numbers are available on the website, so you can do all that. And um, that's it for the announcements. Our next webinar will be announced um, soon and will be communicated via mail to all of you. Um, yeah. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, Nana and William, Oh, why have you muted yourselves? Any final words for us before we leave? <laughs> okay. So yeah. my final words will be to say, you start now. Financial independence is possible, but you have to start now. It is a journey. It is not a spring. Well, I think William just said it all. Um, it's doable. Let, let me put it that way to achieve financial independence. It's doable. It's, don't let it scare you. If you are multiplying by 25, you start seeing a big number. Take your time and prepare to save. It will work uh, for you. I, I think- um, Do the simple, sensible things consistently over a long period of time. Yeah, stay you away from sense. unnecessary loans. Stay away from unnecessary loans try and save well, and then you sh it, shall, it shall be well. Thank you, all of you, for entertaining me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. And we thank you for joining us once again, and we hope to see you the next time we have another webinar. So, okay. um, yeah, so it's bye for now, till next time. Thank you and bye.